Hello, everyone. Why am I smiling? I'm going to give a talk about the end of the world, and I'm smiling. People are strange. Well, the folks at TED tell you never to begin a talk with a diagram of a molecule. Oops. But this isn't any molecule. It doesn't look like much. But when you smell it, oh, it's alluring. It's sensual, it's seductive, it's overpowering, it's almost irresistible. It's called galaxolide, and it's a member of a large group of synthetic fragrance and aroma molecules that have become overabundant in our world. They appear to be innocuous, but they may be insidious. They may be killing us softly with their siren song of seduction. Wow. The only consolation I can offer you is that when we all go together, when we go, we'll be smelling really awesome. <laughs> My own smell story started a little over 30 years ago when at Tel Aviv University we were developing a mouthwash formulation and we showed it to a pharmaceutical company and they asked me whether it worked on bad breath. I had no idea. So I went to the library, started reading about halitosis and body odors, and I became enthralled, intrigued by this human condition. And over the subsequent, this is the mouthwash, and over the subsequent 20, 25 years, <laughs> I have made a living by smelling people. <laughs> I've smelled over 5,000 mouths, thousands of armpits, smelly shoes, putrid saliva samples, you name it, I've smelled it. <laughs> and I smell people as a hobby, too. <laughs> Let's do a small experiment. Um, people are very concerned about bad breath and body odors. Um, anybody in the audience want me to smell their breath right now? Raise your hand, I'll bring you on stage. I'll catch you later, sir. <laughs> um, so I didn't see too many hands in the audience. Let's do another experiment. I'd like to ask everybody now to raise their right hand. And when I count back slowly from five, I'd like you to lean over <laughs> and smell the armpit of the person on your left. Five, four, three, two, one. It works with married people, yes, I know that. <laughs> There's movies about that, too. But maybe there are reasons that we should be so concerned about how we smell. In French and German, when you want to say that you can't stand somebody, you say, I cannot smell that person. Uh, in, a, in a British study, among all the most disgusting human traits, body odor ranked number one. And I can tell you that I once dated a girl with terrible body odor, but I only dated her once. <laughs> bad breath. In Judaism, bad breath is cause for divorce. In another British study, 72% of the women asked said they wouldn't even date a guy with bad breath. The guys were just a little bit less choosy. <laughs> Smell, after all, is our most primordial, our most intimate sense. The signals from smelling something shoot up into our Primitive limbic brain turning on areas of deep emotions and memories. I'll tell you a personal story. I bumped into a young man several days ago, and he had a wonderful natural body odor. And the odor transported me back 40 years to the odor of his father when we were growing up together. Because each of us, when we're born, has our own natural odor, our own imprint, which is composed of our environment, our biology, and our genetics. As babies, babies have a tremendous odor. The day they're born, they bond with the odor of their mothers. That's not a very good day to be wearing perfume. <laughs> and their mothers bond with their odors, their individual unique odors. And of course, we all know the wonderful odor that babies make, this disarming odor. But as we grow through childhood to sexual maturity, the odors that babies make becomes replaced by the odor of making babies. 
that sweet, seductive aroma of you. And maybe that's not too surprising either because human beings are animals. And animals mate based on genetics that they smell and based on, based on mating seasons that they smell. And probably human beings for hundreds of thousands of years smelled each other au naturel and were either attracted or repelled. But in our brave new world of smells, for a couple of tens of dollars, you can have a complete smell makeover. And you can smell wonderfully. But it's not you. Smells are the sense of truth. In Iraq, Iraqi Jews used to say, Ishtamil Idik. I will smell your hand to see whether you are telling the truth. <laughs> we now smell really great, but to paraphrase Paul Simon, we're faking it, not really making it. This item might not appear to you to be something special, but it's worth twice its weight in gold. Actually, you can't get a hold of it now. It's illegal in most countries. This is a musk pod taken from the derriere of an Asian musk deer, the male musk deer. I don't want to tell you what the word musk represents in Sanskrit. You can read about it. This pouch contains a concoction of ferocious odors that the male deer releases, like biological tweets into the ether, evoking behavioral changes in other deer, ostensibly of an intimate matter. The poor thing for the deer and a few other mammalian species is that these molecules seem to work on us as well. So for thousands of years, and I say that because musk is written up in the Jewish Talmud, and that's an old Talmud, we have been hunting this poor musk deer almost to extinction to obtain this organ and putting just a little bit into our top perfumes. The musk deer have almost been exterminated because of our hunger for this smell. I have a feeling now that they might be poised to get their revenge on us. Well, the fever, the fever of fragrance isn't such a new thing. The fever started long ago. Back in ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, people learned the science of how to fragrance themselves using extracts from plants, for example, and I hasten to add that one of the best smelling part of the plant is actually the sexual organ, the flower. And as a biologist, I have no answer why we are attracted like pollinating incense, insects to this wonderful smell. But we are, so we dab a little bit all over us, together with a little smidgen of potent animal odors. But these ancient perfumes were dear, they were expensive, they were exclusive. And they were only used by the rich, the famous, and the powerful, relegating the rest of humanity to go on smelling just the way we are. But that changed completely in the 19th century, when very clever chemists began to understand the nature of the molecules that cause the odors. And then they began to synthesize them in their laboratories and then in their factories, starting with the odor of vanilla, and then fruits, and flowers and nuts. And in 1888, an enterprising scientist named Bauer, who was working on TNT and explosives, came upon a nitromusk compound quite by accident. He just smelled it. And for decades, this became the first synthetic nitromusk. It kind of got the musk deer off the hook, I must say. <laughs> but because it was an explosive molecule, it was replaced in the 1960s by molecules that are more stable, such as galaxolide. Today, galaxolide is a very cheap compound. It's made, like many other fragrance and aroma compounds, it's synthesized from petroleum. And in bulk, it costs less than $10 a kilogram. It's a musk analog. One kilogram of musk odor can power over a thousand bottles of perfume. And over 10,000 tons are produced every year. That's because it doesn't only go into fine fragrances anymore. It goes into cosmetic products, it goes into household products, shampoos, hair conditioner, fabric softener, floor wax, lipstick, potpourri, and I dare say, maybe even pear juice and soon licorice.
It's mentioned in 7,000 patents. Wow. So should we worry about this molecule? I don't know. So I asked an expert, Dr. Paul Blank, an old friend, an international toxicologist, and he looked at the literature. He wrote an article in Psychology Today. And that article was cause for concern because Dr. Blank said a few things about this molecule. It's ubiquitous. It's found everywhere. It's in the water system. It's in sewage up to 40 milligrams a kilogram, which is a lot. Worse than that, it rises through the food chain, concentrating in fish, which we eat. It's found in human body tissues, including in breast milk. But perhaps most worrisome is the fact that it's persistent. It doesn't break down easily. And to top this all off, it appears to interfere with estrogen hormonal function in humans. Dr. Blank concludes that this might not be surprising of a molecule that mimics a sexy substance that mammals use to communicate with one another. So is it dangerous or not? We still don't know. But what is clear is that every year, this compound is going to continue to build up at higher concentrations in the environment and in our body. And someday, ages hence, we might regret that we did not pay more attention to it. Well, what can we do in the meantime? We can stop putting on so many scented products. We can use a lot less fragrance sprayed on our clothes rather than on our skin because it's absorbed. And we can hope that I'm wrong. <laughs> I may be. In 1920, Coco Chanel sampled for the first time her signature perfume, Chanel No. 5, which contained a combo of synthetic nitromusk, and animal musk. In the same year, the very same year, Robert Frost wrote his epic poem about the end of the world, which starts something like this. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. And so do I the fire of desire. But hey, it might not be so bad after all. So why not just turn out the lights and come to bed, my dear? <laughs> Thank you.